All right, welcome to Hoops Tonight, presented by FanDuel here at The Volume. Happy Tuesday, everybody. I hope all of you guys are having a great week so far. Little change of plans tonight. So originally we were going to do an instant reaction video to Grizzlies Pelicans before we got to the rest of the show. But then Desmond Bain was ruled out, Zion Williamson was ruled out, and now that particular game doesn't quite take on the same feel that it had earlier today. So we're going to skip that and just go to the rest of the show. We're going to do a deep dive into the Boston Celtics and their recent success. After beating the Thunder yesterday, they've won seven in a row, and now they have the best record in the league. Then yesterday, there was this kind of this debate running around as to whether or not Tatum and Brown are the best duo in the NBA, which obviously got me thinking. So I've got a list of the top 10 duos in the NBA for you guys today. After that, I finally got to spend a good amount of time this morning doing a deep dive into Shea Gilgis Alexander. With him being buried in Oklahoma City, haven't gotten to spend much time watching him, but he's been unquestionably one of the top 10 players in the NBA to start the season. So I did all, watch almost two hours of footage on him this morning and just about every basket he's made over the course of the season. And I cannot believe how good he is. So we're going to spend some time talking about him. And then at the end, we're going to talk some Golden State Warriors who got back on track with a win against the San Antonio Spurs last night. Their bench got going. Uh, Jordan Poole got back on track. And then I want to talk a little bit about Klay Thompson because there was a, a report that came about uh, came out about him and some of the frustrations with his shooting, which I'm going to come out in his defense a little bit. And then Grizzlies fans, I promise we are going to get to the Grizzlies eventually soon. Desmond Bain is experiencing a leap, and a lot of it has to do with his ability to create his own shot, which is something I was specifically critical of uh, about him in previous seasons. We will get to that eventually. You guys know the drill before we get started. Subscribe to the Volumes YouTube channel so you don't miss any more of our videos. Follow me on Twitter at underscore Jason LT so you guys don't miss any show announcements, as well as footage breakdowns and things along those lines. And then last but not least, if for whatever reason you miss one of these shows and you can't get back over to YouTube to finish, you can find them wherever you get your podcasts podcasts under hoops tonight. All right, let's talk some basketball. So Boston Celtics, seven wins in a row. You know, I had a couple people complaining in my mentions on Twitter that I haven't talked about them that much to start this season. And, you know, it's funny because they were basically all we talked about at the end of last year. Because if those of you guys who've been following the show, I was super high on the Celtics the entire last half of last season and going into that playoff run. Basically up until the finals, I picked them to win. Um, and so they're a team that I've talked about a ton. And so it was kind of nice to kind of get away from the Celtics and talk about some other teams to start the season, but we can't skip over them anymore. They have the best record in the league. They are five and two against 500 or better teams, which is best in the league by a mile. They are first in offense by a mile, four points per 100 possessions ahead of the Nuggets, who I predicted would be number one in offense. However, they are 21st in defense, and that's not getting any better. They are 17th in defense during the seven-game win streak. But I have a theory there. So, you know, rim protection in particular is far more valuable in the regular season. Because the prospect of sitting in a defensive stance and containing ball handlers is extremely taxing physically. It takes a lot more effort, right? Versus a funneling scheme where you have a big man that's lingering around the basket, say like a Robert Williams, when he's lingering around the basket and guys are funneling to them, which is you know a, a scheme that a lot of teams use over the course of 82 games to try to just work their way and eat innings during the regular season. That's just a lot less taxing to do. It's more focus and understanding your rotations and just making sure you funnel in the right directions and things along those lines. And then the big man, it can linger around the basket because there's not really the game planning that you see in playoff series that require you to be better on the perimeter, right? So Robert Williams's injury specifically was going to ask the Boston Celtics to defend in a different way. Now, they've always had that look. Even in the playoffs last year, they had their Robert Williams look, and then they had their Al Horford at the five look when they would bring Derek, Derek White into the game, right? I liked their uh, Al Horford at the five lineups better. We've been over that extensively. The gist of it is, is I think Robert Williams and what he does is, uh, you know, it, it like the vertical spacing is good, but vertical spacing is never the same as five out spacing, in my opinion. I've said that time and time again on the show. It's just way harder to make defensive rotations in five out spacing. And then in general, on the defensive end, I thought Robert Williams also gambled quite a bit and got out of position and them using him as a roamer actually hurt their defense in a lot of specific cases. And most importantly, they still defended really well. 
without Robert Williams on the floor last year. Now, in this regular season, without Robert Williams, their defense hasn't been the same. But it's been because of that perimeter defense that I'm talking about. You're now asking that lineup, you know, with Al Horford at the five, you're asking those groups to sit in a stance and contain at a higher level than they're used to doing during the regular season, and they just simply haven't done that. But I'm encouraged because you're still seeing these pockets of really good defense when the Celtics lock in, and they still look every bit as stifling as they did last year. And you've seen that a lot over the course just in the last week. So last night against the Thunder, for instance, Jalen Brown really struggling to guard Shea Gilders Alexander. In general, everything looks sloppy. They're killing you with pick and pop uh, with Poku, and it doesn't look good. You're down, you know, the, the, the Thunder pretty much controlled that game through, uh, through three quarters and some change. But then from the eight-minute mark to the one-minute mark of the fourth quarter, Boston sat in a damn defensive stance. Jalen Brown did a much better job on Shea Gilgis-Alexander. Tatum got a stop on Shea uh, Gilgis-Alexander as well. They forced a turnover on Lou Dort on a drive. They blocked Josh Giddy at the rim. They sat in a stance and they played much better defense, and they allowed just eight points over seven minutes from the eight-minute mark to the one-minute mark. Now, Boston's offense wasn't lighting the world on fire during that span. They only scored 16 points themselves, but their defense gave them a chance to win that game. And then it was tied at 115, and Marcus Smart hit that tough contested three on the left wing, and then Derek White hit a nasty movement three coming up from the left wing and turning and squaring up in midair to knock down the three. And then Marcus Smart hit a driving layup on SGA to ice the game, and the game's over. So, again, like when I'm looking at uh, especially teams that have had a lot of deep playoff runs who might succumb to some regular season malaise. I'm curious to see what their switch looks like. What does it look like when they really turn it on? And as far as I can tell, Boston is still able to flip that switch and strangle teams when they need to. You guys might remember, I think it was just over a week ago when, um, uh, when they, uh, played the Memphis Grizzlies, similar type of deal game tied at 90 with eight minutes left. We covered this game. If you guys remember, there was, uh, it was tied at 90 with just about eight minutes left and they held the Grizzlies scoreless. Five possessions in a row. They forced Desmond Bain into a tough step back. They forced John Morant into a tough step back. They couldn't score. Then on the other end of the floor, Boston scored 10 points, and the game was over. So they flipped the switch, and they were able to get the win. Uh, earlier this weekend, when they played the Nuggets, same deal. They're only up 88-87 with three minutes left in the third. And over the course of the next seven minutes, they allowed just eight points they score 23, suddenly you're up 16 and the game is over. So there's clear examples for Boston of them being able to flip the switch because during the regular season without Rob Williams, you're asking them to contain on the perimeter, which is just really taxing emotionally, physically, and mentally, right? So they're, they're, not, they're not dialed in enough on that end of the floor you know, a a possession in and possession out over the course of the season. But they're still demonstrating that when they lock in, they can do that. And Robert Williams will come back. And when he does, that should bolster their regular season defense. They should take over at that point. And here's another thing too. With how good their offense has been, again, I predicted the Nuggets would be the best offense in the league. Nope, they're second. And the Celtics are four points better per 100 possessions. I talked about how the Clippers were the best driving kick team in the league and the Celtics were like, the, the, the team that wanted to be the Clippers. No, th- that's not the case anymore. The Celtics are the best drive and kick team in the league. They're the best offense in the league, and it's not close. Their combination of ball handling and shooting now has made them incredibly difficult to guard. Jason Tatum and Jalen Brown have both taken leaps. And, and, you know, here's the deal. I'm still picking Milwaukee out of the East, but we are set up for what should be an all-time great Eastern Conference Finals. I can't wait. And, yes, I'd pick Milwaukee, but Boston absolutely has a chance to win that series. So, um, over the course of the last couple of days, as the Celtics have gotten back on track, there's been this debate that's been thrown out. You know, are Jason Tatum and Jalen Brown the best duo in the NBA? Now, I was inclined to agree, but I wanted to dig into it a little bit and just make sure that my head was in the right place. So, I did, and I put together a list of the top 10 duos in the NBA. So what I'm going to do for time's sake, for the top five, I'm going to dive into some numbers. I'm just going to list six through 10, and then I have an honorable mention list as well. So I agree. Number one, I have Jason Tatum and Jalen Brown. They're averaging 57, 14 rebounds, 
and seven assists. Both are over 58% true shooting. So they're both scoring at an incredibly high rate and an incredibly efficient rate. They're two of the best perimeter defenders in the league. I think Jason Tatum is clearly a top five player right now. Look, like I have a lot of predictions. It's part of the job. I'm wrong sometimes, and you guys always let me know when I'm wrong. I'm going to be wrong sometimes. I'm going to be right sometimes. One of the things I was right about was when I put Tatum at six. I put Tatum at six because I said his playoff run was real, and if it was anybody else, you guys would be acknowledging it. And everyone called me insane, and Jason Tatum has been a top five player this year. That's been one of the things that I've been right about. And then Jalen Brown is firmly a top 15 player in this league. So top five and top 15 – Two of the best perimeter defenders in basketball, 57, 14, and 7. Yeah, I think Jason Tatum and Jalen Brown are the best duo in the league. Number two, Giannis Antetokounmpo and Drew Holiday. 51 points, 18 rebounds, 13 assists. Both will make all defense teams, although I think Giannis is pretty clearly the best defensive player in the world right now. He's the best player in the world right now. But Drew is somewhere around 30th. But you can't, you know, we can't overlook the team's success. Giannis and Drew, you know, without Chris Middleton last year, damn near beat that Celtics team, okay? And then this year, they have been right up at the top of the league without Chris Middleton, without Pat Connaughton. Those dudes just know how to win basketball games. They play both ends of the floor. Giannis is the best player in the world. I have them as the second best duo in the league. All right, number three, Steph Curry and Andrew Wiggins. 50 points, 12 rebounds, 9 assists, both over 59% true shooting. Steph Curry is at a career high, 69.2% true shooting. He's the best that he's ever been. Steph is a good defensive player. Andrew Wiggins is in in the conversation for the best perimeter defender alive. I have Steph as the second best player in the world right now. Andrew Wiggins is somewhere in that 35 to 40 range. Once again, we got to acknowledge the winning that they've done over the course of the last couple of years. I have them at number three. Number four, Joel Embiid and James Harden. Combining for 54 points, 17 rebounds, and 14 assists. Both over 59% true shooting. Embiid is having the best perimeter shooting season of his career. Don't look at the three-point numbers. He is lighting the world on fire from mid-range this year. He's somewhere around the sixth or seventh best player in the league. And then James Harden, like, I know he's hurt right now, but he definitely looked more spry before the injury. Not quite 2019 James Harden, but he looked more spry. He's somewhere around the 20th best player in the league. As a duo, they aren't as good defensively as they should be, but with as good as uh, Joel Embiid has been this year, and with James Harden firmly being right around the 20th best player in the league, I have them as the fourth best duo in the league. All right, number five. And again, I need you, like... We got to look past the roster here and look at the players. I have LeBron James and Anthony Davis. They're averaging 49, 20 rebounds, and 10 assists. Both are top four in the league in restricted area makes per game. For the record, you're going to, because of how terrible the Lakers are, there's going to be a ton of pushback here, but we have to look past that. They are playing with far and away the worst supporting cast in the league. It's not close. Every other duo on this list has significantly more help flanking them than LeBron James and Anthony Davis do. There are players starting games for the Lakers, multiple players that have started games for the Lakers that would not even make rotations for other players on this list. Rob Palenka and Jeannie Buss have absolutely destroyed the roster around LeBron James and Anthony Davis. That is why the team is struggling as much as they have been. However, I used to consider LeBron James top five Anthony Davis top five as well in 2020. Anthony Davis has declined, and now LeBron James has declined as well. I think both of them have still firmly been in that 15 to 11 range. And they're look, here's the thing. As we're looking at this list, the only other duo on this list that I can firmly say both players are top 15 players in the league is Tatum and Brown. So you can slander the Lakers all you want. Hell, I do too. I do it half of the week here, right? But... Yeah, and, and we can acknowledge that LeBron James and Anthony Davis are having down years. They absolutely are. But they're still an incredibly imposing duo. And I would imagine that LeBron James is going to pick his game up over the course of the season. And Anthony Davis just played his best game probably in the last two seasons. So we can slander the Lakers, but we can't look past the fact that LeBron James and Anthony Davis, two top 15 players in the league, they are the fifth best duo in the league. They just play with the worst roster in basketball right now. 
All right, I'm going to rip through the, the, the back five pretty quick here. So number six, I have Zion and Brandon Ingram. Number seven, I have John Morant and Desmond Bain. Number eight, I have Nikola Jokic and Jamal Murray. Number nine, Luka Doncic and Spencer Dinwiddie. And number 10, Trey Young and DeJounte Murray. The groups that missed the cut for me, KD and Kyrie, because Kyrie can't stay by Kevin Durant's side long enough to even be considered a duo. Same goes for Kawhi and Paul George, as Kawhi just can't stay on the court. I had Trey Young and DeJounte, uh, DeJounte Murray narrowly missing the cut. Uh, Damian Lillard and Anthony Simons. Oh, you could even go with Jeremy Grant there, depending on how much you value the defensive end of the floor. And then Donovan Mitchell and Darius Garland. So if I was going to 15, those would be the next five that I would do. All right, before we move on to the Warriors, I wanted to talk about Shea Gilgis Alexander for a little bit. I I literally can't believe how good this kid is. Like I said, just by virtue, of, like uh, the, it's the nature of this job. Like if I'm covering the top teams in the league, and with how much footage I have to watch, how much film I have to watch, how much research I have to do into the numbers, and and especially when we get into the postseason and the workload there, I can't. I can't spend a ton of time watching the Orlando Magic or watching these teams that are at the bottom of the league. And so over the course of the last couple of years, I've, you know, occasionally caught an S- a, a Shea Gilders Alexander game. I've, I've watched him, you know, a few dozen times over the course of the last few seasons, but I haven't really dived, I haven't taken the chance yet to really dive into Shea the way that I do with the other top players in the league. And so I did this morning and I watched about two hours of film on him. I watched almost every single basket that he's made this season and I literally can't believe how good he is. I, I like I sent out a poll just to because I was like, man, this kid's one of the ten best basketball players alive. And so I sent out a poll to Twitter just to get a, a feel for the way that everyone else was thinking. And I was like, is Shea Gilgis, Gilgis Alexander a top ten player in the NBA? And over eighty percent of you agreed with me. He's only twenty four years old, so he's Jason Tatum's age. Which, by the way, that's insane that Jason Tatum's only twenty four years old. He's six foot six with a six eleven wingspan. Um, he's only one hundred ninety five pounds, but he plays strong. And, and there's there, there's a huge difference between playing strength and actual strength. It's it's the the willingness to be physically aggressive, regardless of what your physical tools are. Obviously, ideally, you want both if you're going to play bully ball, right? Like a LeBron James type of guy. But even if you're not overly strong, you can play strong, and that will make up for it a lot. Kevin Durant's one of my favorite examples of this. He's skinny, but physical defenders don't have a ton of success on him because he plays physical back, even though he is skinny. And Shea kind of falls into that uh, class as well. So there was a play in the middle of the third quarter last night against uh, against the Celtics where SGA had uh, Jalen Brown in an ISO on the left wing. And Jalen is sitting in his stance, and Shea drives left. And Jalen cuts him off and catches him on the chest like squares him up and Shea just bumps him off and then hits the gas again. And Jalen retreats and catches off uh, catches back and cuts him off again in the chest. And Shea just pushes through him and gets all the way to the basket, makes a right-handed layup on the left side of the rim. And I'm watching that and I'm like, Jalen Brown is significantly bigger and stronger than Shea and Shea bullied him. And it's because he was playing with physicality, understanding angles, understanding the way that the officiating works, and knowing that he was able to punch those gaps even at only 195 pounds. That's really impressive to me. This year, he's averaging 32 points, four rebounds, and six assists on 63% true shooting. They've won six games out of 13 games that he's played in, which is pretty damn solid when you look at the rest of that roster. And I'm, I'm excited about the Thunder in the future, but right now they still don't have that much talent. They beat the Clippers twice. They beat the Mavs. They beat the Raptors. They're just a solid basketball team. These are not, this is not, you know, guy putting up good numbers on a bad team. The Thunder, when they're on your schedule now, other NBA coaches are like, oh no. Like, my locker room thinks this is the Thunder and they don't realize that this is a good basketball team coming to town. If you don't bring your A game against the Thunder, you lose flat out because Shea is a top 10 player. You know, Mark Dagenal, I hope I'm pronouncing that correctly, is, is, has got these guys playing beautiful basketball on both ends of the floor. They're, like you, you, you have to be prepared to play the Thunder or you're going to lose. So looking into his skill set a little bit, 
there there are some stats with SGA that defy that defy any conventional basketball wisdom. Here's the first one. He gets to the rim at an insane rate for a 195 pound guard. These are the league leaders in restricted area makes. Giannis Antetokounmpo is number one. Zion Williamson is number two. Anthony Davis is number three. LeBron James is number four. That's why they're still one of the best duos in the league, despite having that terrible roster. Luka Doncic is at number five. And Shea Gildas Alexander is number six in the league in restricted area makes per game. He's making 5.2 shots in the restricted area at 72%. And remember, for a guard, I'm looking at like 60% as an efficient rate there. He's above Joel Embiid in restricted area makes. He's above Ja Morant in restricted area makes. He's above Nikola Jokic in restricted area makes. What do I say is the most valuable skill on the offensive end in the NBA this year? Pull-up jump shooting. You guys know how much I value that. He's 47% on 10 pull-up jumpers per game. That's top tier. That's not I'm good. That's not I'm great. That's I am among the very best pull-up jump shooters in the league. He's also shooting 46% on catch-and-shoot threes. And then passing the basketball, six assists is perfectly fine and acceptable for a score at the volume that he's scoring. He does not have an offensive weakness right now. And this is where it gets crazy. This is the second great stat. How many players in the league do you think average at least 1.5 steals and 1.5 blocks? It's one. It's Shea. That's it. Nobody else. <laughs> like, how, how ridiculous is that? He's the only guy in the league who's blocking one and a half shots and getting one and a half steals as a 195-pound guard. I, like every Again, between that and the rim finishing, it just completely defies any conventional basketball wisdom. He has unquestionably been one of the 10 best players in the league to start the season. I messed up bad by leaving him off of my pl- uh, power, uh, my player rankings last week. Will not make that mistake again. He's going to be on next week's list. And the Thunder have themselves one hell of a franchise cornerstone. You know, what impresses me the most with Shea when I was watching the footage today there's, he's got all the stuff that you look for in a lead guard, right? Like he's got good size and good length, um, a great pull-up jump shot, great catch-and-shoot jump shot. He's got a great floater. He's got a great handle. But so many of the players that you see that fit that mold only play one way, especially as freak athletes, which Shea is also a very gifted athlete. Most of them are just downhill. Everything's 100 miles an hour. Shea has old man game already. He's extremely shifty, lots of starts and stops. He plays slow sometimes, but then he can hit the jets and play fast. Like you, you're watching him like, it's almost like, like, you know how I was talking about Karis Levert and how he kind of plays that old man game. Shea can do that, but then he can also hit the jets with his first step. And that's what makes it such a deadly combo because like, You'll see him methodically work his way to a basket, but then it'll be like crunch time against the Boston Celtics, and he'll just hit the Jets going left and just toast by Jalen Brown, one of the best perimeter defenders in the basketball or in the in the league, and make a left-handed layup and one against Al Horford. So like he can hit the Jets, he can play slow, he can shift gears. the The way that that specifically helps him so much is it's about being unpredictable, you know. Almost none of Shea Gilgis Alexander's baskets look the same. Every one of them kind of has a different flair to it. Even his pull-up jump shots to a certain extent. The footwork is a little different. His quickness of his release, sometimes he rushes the release, sometimes he's slow with the release. What that means is he's always available to make a counter. And that makes him extremely difficult to defend. Luka is very good with this as well, where it's kind of like he's entirely planning his approach based on what the defense is doing instead of based on what he feels like doing. And that constantly keeps you off balance. It, is spe- it, it will make him a very good playoff player when he gets to that point because defenses will continue to throw new wrinkles at him. Like, the, the, uh, I, it, like he, he kind of doesn't have a weakness right now. It, it's, it's wild. It, he's, uh, he's one of the 10 best players in the world. I can't, I can't believe it. I can't believe how good Shea Gildas Alexander is. And I'm really excited because I'm going to be watching him a lot more now. Um, especially since the Thunder are probably, you know, when Chet Holmgren comes back, they're going to have like that, you know, because they, they, they were really hurt in Boston last night with that pick and pop with uh, um, with Alexei po- uh, Pokashevsky. And they're just going to be this like 
really interesting team that has shooting bigs and consistently plays five out and and has ton of length and athleticism on the perimeter because they kind of sneaky have a bunch of wings as well. And Lou Dort's one of the best perimeter defenders in basketball as well. Like they're they're a super interesting team. They just need that one more piece, and maybe Chet ends up being that guy for them. And who knows? Maybe they'll end up shutting down SGA at some point this year, and they'll end up moving up in the draft lottery and getting you know another good player this year. They have a ton of draft picks, so they've always got that like. Let's flip two or three salaries and five picks for a you know some disgruntled star somewhere in the league, and then you could see somewhere where you're looking at you know Shea Gilgis Alexander, Lou Dort, you know Chet Holmgren, you know and and one other legitimate NBA All Star, you know, and you're in great shape. So uh, man, like <laughs> the Thunder have been really just you know uh, like hanging out around the bottom of the league ever since the Russell Westbrook trade. And uh, the, you could see the light at the end of the tunnel now. There's like a really exciting future there. All right, so the Warriors get back on track. They beat the hell out of the Spurs. Jordan Poole got back out track if you, on track. If you remember our last show, I was talking about how him in particular has really been struggling in his last six games, and it's a big part of why the Warriors bench has been struggling. Well, what do, what do I always say to do when you're in a slump? Find easy shots. Build your rhythm with easy shots. Instead of trying to pound your head through the wall, like, oh, I'm in this slump. I can't believe it. Let me keep taking these step back threes, you know, where it's going to make you get further into your head because even on your best day, a difficult three might go in 35% of the time, which means you're twice as likely to miss it as you are to make it, right? Well, he attacked the rim for his first two shot attempts. He got a driving layup on the right side of the rim and then a reverse layup on the left side of the rim, got his confidence and rhythm. Then the three point shot started falling. Next thing you know, he has 36 points on an assortment of shots. He had driving layups, transition layups, pull-up threes, movement threes, transition threes, got to the foul line. Just a, an all-around scoring performance from Jordan Poole. Hot take, guys. The Warriors are better when Jordan Poole is playing well. Um, but the exciting part is the bench played really well. The uh, Jonathan Kaminga, Moses Moody, and Anthony Lamb trio played really well. They were all moving without the basketball and hunting for each other. They had a really good chemistry work in last night. Uh, they combined for 10 assists and 10 made threes. I want to zoom in on Anthony Lamb for a minute. So, you know, it's interesting because I would argue that he's been their best bench wing to start this year because Moody's had a rough defensive season. Jonathan Kaminga's all over the place. And it's interesting because he's undrafted. He's an undrafted player from 2020. He was bounced around the league, played in the G League a little bit, got some, you know, brief stints in Houston and in San Antonio. But he started getting minutes about halfway through this season when Steve Kerr was really grasping at straws to get something going from the bench. And it, it, I don't think it's a coincidence why he's succeeded. He's six foot six. He's almost 230 pounds, so he can guard up in position. He competes like crazy on the defensive end. In fact, he has the best defensive rating on the team among rotation players. The Warriors are allowing just 108.4 points per 100 possession in his minutes, which is best on the team. Him and Dante DiVincenzo are right there at that level. And then he can make shots. He's shooting 55% on threes this year. And then this is uh, an important part. He makes all the right reads in the Warriors system. He just does he doesn't force things. He understands how to work in those four on threes, make the extra passes, attack closeouts well. This season he has 10 assists to just 5 turnovers so far. They like I've said so many times, they need a couple of guys to rise up to the role of dependable playoff bench wing. It might be a trade, it might be the buyout market, or it might be Moses Moody and Anthony Lamb. Obviously, we need to see a lot more good basketball from them, from them for the Warriors to trust them in those situations, but you're starting to see some progress there. Anthony Lamb looks like a piece that they might be able to use. Obviously, with their um, luxury tax situation, I'm sure they'd prefer to not have to go out and sign more bodies or bring in a larger salary. So, hey, that would be perfect if uh, if Anthony Lamb and Moses Moody kind of developed into those guys. Last note on the, on the Warriors – Clay Thompson. There was a report that came out, and who knows, um, had the legitimacy of this one. I personally doubt it, but that there was some frustration, uh, fr some frustration building in the Warriors' locker room over Clay Thompson's shot selection, and that he's been trying to shoot his way out of his slump. I personally don't believe the report. It, it just, I, it just doesn't seem like something that the Warriors' locker room would complain about. I don't think Dre would complain about it. I don't think Steph would complain about it. I don't think Jordan Poole would complain about it. I don't think any of the coaches would. It just doesn't. It just, it just something stinks about that. I'm not, I'm not really sure. 
And honestly, I just don't think that there's any chance that they end up changing his role, like bringing him off the bench or using him less. First of all, it's not as bad as it looks. He's shooting 31% on catch and shoot threes this year, which, yeah, is that below where you expect Clay Thompson to be? Sure. But that's also 0.93 points per possession. That's the advantage of the three point shot. They're just worth more points. So everyone's freaking out about Clay Thompson's shooting, and he's still getting you almost a point per possession when he rises up into a shot. And this is the most important part. Teams are still guarding Clay Thompson as though he's Clay Thompson. That is arguably more valuable than the actual shot going in because of the things that it opens up for the Warriors on the interior. He's also shooting 29% when he's wide open this year, when the defender is at least six feet away. That's just an anomaly. Those shots are going to go in eventually. We saw a similar thing last year with Steph. Steph was having a rough shooting year. Weirdly enough, it was the wide open shots that weren't going in. And it ended up not mattering because he figured it out in time for the playoffs. And most importantly, Clay Thompson is one of the best perimeter defenders in the league. Him figuring out how to guard Jalen Brown and contain his dribble drive over the second half of the NBA Finals turned that series around because Wiggins was doing such a good job on Jason Tatum that the Celtics offense went to shit. And then they couldn't score and the Warriors ran away winning three games in a row. If he's guarded the way that he's guarded, and he is guarding the way that he's guarding, then if he hits even 30% of his catch-and-shoot threes, he's an immensely valuable NBA playoff player. He's not the problem. I'm not worried about him at all. He's also coming off these two massive injuries. So yeah, he wasn't quite in the best shape coming into this season because he's a little bit paranoid about working too hard over the summer because of what happened to him when he tore his Achilles. I get it. I just, I'm just, I could not possibly be any less worried about Clay Thompson. And, and in general, with the Warriors, they still have so many cards to play here. Like, yes, it's great that Anthony Lamb is developing. Yes, it's great that, you know, Moses Moody might be one of those guys and they might need to make a trade. They might need to sign a buyout guy, but they still have so many other moves in their deck. Like, when push comes to shove, they're going to play Clay Thompson 42 minutes, Steph Curry 42 minutes, Draymond Green 42 minutes. And then suddenly the bench becomes less important. You know, Andrew Wiggins could play 46 minutes, you know. Uh, they could dust Andre Iguodala off to play little bench shifts here and there. I, I'm just I, – I, I, I just remain completely unconcerned. Like, yeah, like they're struggling this year. We need to uh, account for that when we're doing things like power rankings and talking about, you know, potentially them up against the best teams in the league, right? Like the Bucks and Celtics who have both looked so good. But it just these are small problems, and I still it, it, when we're looking at the rest of the Western Conference, there's a bunch of issues there. The Nuggets are struggling against the good teams. The Clippers can't score, right? Like there's just there at the end of this when this is all said and done, I would be stunned if the Warriors didn't win the Western Conference. The Eastern Conference is way more up in the air. There's still so much, you know, kind of like intrigue there. I, I just you're the safe bet in the West is to stick with the Warriors. All right, guys, that is all I have for tonight. Remember, we're going double live tomorrow. We're doing uh, we're covering the early game on AMP, and then we're going uh, live after, I believe it's Warrior Suns, uh, tomorrow night on YouTube after the final buzzer. As always, I sincerely appreciate your guys' support, and I will see you next time.